Welcome to an extra special ARG event. I'm your good buddy, Amigo Aaron, joined by a man known to, throughout the lands as the contest master. I give you the Brent. And I am the contact, contest master. <laughs> Speak, speaky no good, though. We are going to be spinning the prize wheel today, Aaron, and three lucky winners are going to be getting some fabulous prizes. But before we get to that, we need to talk about C64 cartridge games. That's right. Uh, in case you didn't join us last week, we spun the wheel, we made the deal, and this week uh, we'll be taking a look at games that were on cartridge on the C64. Uh, now, <clears throat> Brent, I didn't know exactly how expansive the C64 cartridge collection was, and I thought, hey, I bet if they got like maybe 50 Maybe hundreds. No, they got hundreds and hundreds of these things. Yeah. So actually finding a cartridge uh, to play on the C64 was no uh, tough shakes. But before we get into that uh, exact uh, item, I want to talk about the concept of computers with cartridge slots. It's something that sort of came and went, and not every computer had them. Why, what do you think the motivation for adding a cartridge slot is, and why do you think that ultimately they, they never really caught on uh, with a modern machine, because it seems like a pretty good way to to easily distribute games without having to worry about piracy, for example. Well, there's a few problems with cartridges. There's a there, let's go over the advantages right. first. Advantage number one, easy. You put it in, you turn it on, bam, your game's there. I mean, some of them you have to command line it, but most of them will check the cartridge slot and then lo load right, right up. So. That is a huge factor, especially back in the day when people were just getting used to computers. It was something familiar, something easy, perfect way to doing it. Why don't they do it now? Cost. There's no doubt. Because to get a game that would fit on a cartridge, well, I mean, it'd have to be an SD card, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, cartridges, the that's actual... That's where I was going, yeah. Yeah, PCB... Uh, things no chance that will never ever happen again it's just too i mean expensive. if you look at if you look at the switch for example now granted it's not a computer but uh they they went to the uh sort of the sd uh route and i mean in all honesty what is an sd card it's a cartridge just tiny you know it's effectively it's very similar it's a data it's a, a data uh uh platform but uh you know getting back to the original machines with cartridge slots i mean think about it uh, machines like the vic 20 and the C64, the Coco, they had cartridge slots. And then you've got uh, computers like the Atari series. Some of the Atari computers had two cartridge slots uh, in them, if you'll recall. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> cartridges are important. How much of that do you think uh, just stems from the fact that the original console had, had cartridges and they just sort of wanted to follow the same route? Or how much, I mean, do you think piracy, for example, was thought of that much back in the day? I'd, probably, I'd say they probably didn't really consider it being a big deal at the early in the in the run of computers. Well, um, no, I don't agree with that. I think it was a big deal pretty much from day one. But uh, cartridges, obviously, they also have the huge advantage of being quick. Yeah. Uh, and, and old the older computers uh, where speed was a huge factor, being quick is important. Yeah. So anything you could just you know not have to wait on. Plus, like the the double cart systems, like the Atari, some of the Atari systems, a, a lot of those were like OS type things too, yeah. where you you would boot off to do your DOS stuff or whatever. <laughs> uh, well, their version yeah, of. Yeah. So I think that. The reason why cartridge slots aren't around today, twofold. One would be uh, cost, and, and the second one would be the OSs nowadays are easy enough to maneuver where that's no longer a factor. Yeah. Uh, so what advantages are left? They're not going to be faster. Uh, they're not going to be cheaper. So what motivation do companies have to put things on a cartridge. Yeah, and no, you're right. They sort of the the need for them has long since passed. But uh, early in the day, they were they were, they were actually quite useful for stuff. I mean, uh uh the, you've got uh, aside from the fact you put games and utilities on them <clears throat> and the C64 or the Spectre, these things are a perfect example of of uh slots being used to, for hardware. Like the C64, I've got the uh, Epic Spaslo cartridge stuck in my C64 right now. 
and it is a huge uh, difference uh, when it comes to loading up. I mean, uh, they you've also got stuff that would grab, uh, you know, memory to to do backups, uh, which was always a good thing. Uh, they the so they actually use that that interface for hardware, which is it's a it's a neat idea. I don't think a ton of computers did that, but some did. They use it to great effect. Uh, but again, I don't think. I mean, clearly, expansion has moved well past the need for that. But at the time, they were sure handy. Now, I never. You know, we had a Coco for years, as you know. <clears throat> did we yes. ever own a cartridge? I don't think we ever did. Did we? Because we had we played all of our stuff off tape until we got a uh, until we got the uh, disc the drive. disc drive. The only cartridge <clears throat> I can remember us having, and this is a real cheat, would be the voice. Uh, is the sound the sound uh, uh, pack? Uh, it, right, and that was that was an expansion. Yeah, I don't think we, I, I don't consider that a cartridge uh, product. Yeah, I don't think we that ever just had used any the slot for expansion. Yeah. Now I can't think of a single one either. I was sitting here trying to ponder anything that I remember actually loading into the into the computer, uh, and I can't think of it. So if we did, if we did have a cart, we never ever used yeah. it. Now I think some you know I think some systems were more cartridge centric than others and I, I again the c64 is not one or the uh the coca is not one i think of that is really i don't even think of the c64 either i mean i know people had tons of cartridges but all my friends played the c64 stuff off disc drives or tape and so i don't we hardly played anything off cartridge i will say the vic 20 is one i think of or I, I, that's one i know a lot of people played carts on my buddy in fact curse just mentioned this in the chat my buddy had a a, a ti in fact, I had a couple buddies that had TIs, and they had a they had a lot of cartridges for that. Uh, but I don't think they had anything. I don't, I'm trying to think of that. I don't know if they had anything but cartridges. I don't recall with them loading anything off tape or disc. So I guess if you don't want to go down the route of actually using your computer's uh, tape uh, interface or disc drive, then pretty much cartridges is all you've got. I guess it's better than nothing. Well, I, there are definitely times, uh, especially with the Atari, that I wish it was on a cart, but, you know... It, it wasn't. We like you said. We made almost all of our stuff off of other means. Now, Aaron, something with a cartridge slot. <clears throat> obviously, uh, it disappeared, uh, and we don't have that kind of thing today. But really, the cartridge slot for a modern computer is just all the I/O I/O ports and USB ports and whatnot. It just evolved through the time, uh, much like for. The C64, sure, you could plug in games to it, but it was also a expansion port just as much as it was for games. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, I, it, it's, I, like, I always like stuff with cartridges. I, when I think of collecting cartridges, the number one system I think of is the Atari. Uh, they released tons and tons of cartridges for that, and our neighbors had lots of them. Uh, the Atari, uh, the 8-bits. Uh, that's when I think, uh, that's the, the big collections of cartridges I saw that I knew, like I said, the Vic and the Atari, they're the ones that, that I think of. And yeah. really, the Atari, the way that thing was structured, really all you could put in there was software. There wasn't anything wacky that I that, that I ever saw. I ended up getting hold of a peripheral for the Atari that was a cartridge base, but it was a real wacky. I never saw anything else for it. And like you said, most of these other systems, when you, I mean, I guess technically you're right, when you go into like the expansion slots, that, that's sort of cartridges, but it's it's not the same. It's not hard, stuff that you're going to, you know, pull out every day like you would in a cartridge slot. So, pretty wacky. Uh, it was easy. I, you know, I, I looked. I've got a huge list here. I'm not going to go over it. It's just, it's huge. But there were a ton of cartridge games released on the on the C64, tons and tons. So, it was no great task to pick a couple. <clears throat> Brent, I'll, I'll lead the show today. Uh, All right. I, you know, I did a, uh, um, I did an Atari 8-bit stream uh, uh, last year. And one of the games I came across... Uh, was the game I'm going to do today on the C64. I, I, I just happened to see it, and I was like, you know, that I remember having a, uh, a little taste of that game, and so I thought, this is the day I'm going to break this out in the C64. And that game is a little game from Activision called Pathfinder. A lot of people think it's Pathfinder. It's Pathfinder. Uh, a stupid name, no doubt, but it is what it is. Uh, yeah. This was uh, released on cartridge and disc and tape. So this is, they... they they got they touched every po possible medium to get this out to the C64. Uh, this also got, of course, I mentioned it's got an Atari 8-bit release. It's also got an MSX release, which I haven't seen yet. Uh, in terms of rarity, uh, uh, I had a rough time gauging 
there's not a, uh, unlike Atari, there's not like a C64 slate that I saw that has a real good rarity uh, rating for carts, but apparently this one's fairly rare from what I read just from, from forum chats and stuff. Uh, again, this was published by Activision and developed at Activision as well, uh, Brent. So <laughs> the, uh, the uh, game was done by uh, D- uh, David Lubar, uh, David uh, also did a game called Ogre. Uh, he did Shanghai, and he did Wearing Time as Carmen San Diego. So he had a couple games under his belt. The CD, uh, the uh, C sixty four adaptation was done by Tim Wilson. Uh, he was responsible for a game called The Blade of Blackpool. It's as far as I can tell, that's all he ever did on the on the uh, C sixty four. That sounds yeah, cool. It, I think it's a graphics text adventure. Uh, to be to be honest with you, so what is Pathfinder? Well. You know, it's it's. I I looked up the manual here, and I'll give you a little tidbit here to kind of set this up. Um, by the year eighty-eight seventy-eight A.D., exploration had become a thing of the past. Looking into the past, searching and unearthing its mysteries and uncovering its adventures, the ruling council had bestowed this critical task to an elite group of stellar explorers known simply as past finders. To join their ranks, one must possess the stamina to search hundreds of uncharted lands, the knowledge to select only the proper tools for survival, the ability to dissect complex maps, and the unending desire to live dangerously. Membership is now open to you. That's the tagline on the back of the box, Brent, as you get into this thing. So, yeah, yeah. what do you do in Pathfinder? This is a, a real unusual game. I mean, there's no doubt. So, at its heart... What you're doing in Pathfinder is taking this futuristic vehicle and going through a radiated landscape to collect artifacts. All right, and then once these artifacts are obtained, uh, the, your goal is to drop them off at a uh, the basically a base or a, a a depository for the artifacts. Now, the vehicle you drive is uh, a four-legged uh, spider, like almost like a spider-like creature. It actually, it, it walks and jumps, and you actually, when you walk, it actually sort of rotates in a real wacky way. It, it's actually quite cool. This is what first caught my eye back when I saw this for the Atari, just the way this thing moved across the landscape. It's a, uh, a the screen moves, uh, <clears throat> you're ever moving forward up the screen uh, in, in your search for these artifacts. Now, uh, this there are multiple enemies and dangers on these when you go down onto these uh, play fields. You've got barriers and the barriers range from brick walls to like rotating poles to like walls that come up and down in the landscape. Uh, there, There's always some kind of barriers there. Then you've also got just aliens or, or enemies. Uh, you've got uh, uh, floating crystals and you've got all sorts of bizarre looking uh, bad guys and occasionally a ship will come down and try to get you. So you've also got to contend with that. And then lastly, you've also got to contend with radiation. Uh, In this world, radiation has ravaged the the landscape. And you have to try to keep yourself from becoming fully irradiated and dying uh, through various means. Now, what are you doing down here? Well, you're you're looking for for artifacts, right? And artifacts on the screen are sort of like... They look almost like a pizza pan with an X on it. I guess is the best way to describe it. Kind of a flat. <laughs> is that does that sound about right to you? Well, I mean, okay. yeah, I, mean, what? I guess it's, it's, it's a kind of like the X Men symbol flat. That's right. Yeah, like <laughs> uh, and you're and you need to get these uh, uh, artifacts. And then once you get an all, you get as many as you can, and you can get tons. You need to you need to drop these things off at like the designated like base area, which is sort of this raised. It was sort of this raised. Um, it almost kind of looks like your ship, but it's it's a different color and it's it's stationary. And you've got to r- you basically run over it, and it will drop off these artifacts, and you'll get points. So that's the meat of the game. Uh, when you start the game, you are on a map screen, and you basically can pick which direction you want to go on this map, and you uncover the map as you play through the game, as you as you continually defeat these various. Uh, these various areas, some and some, and the map has different colors to tell you how radiated it is. And if as you go through it, it the red areas will give you radiation poisoning quicker than the green areas. Pretty simple stuff. 
Uh, along the way, you'll learn that there are aliens that you can actually shoot that will actually take your radiation down. There are the, there's these little there are these little floating diamond looking type uh, gimmicks. If you shoot them, they will actually lower your radiation. You and you that's something you need to know because it, those things are around a lot. And if you don't shoot those things as often as you can, uh, you will uh, be very close to being dead or dying. Uh, the uh, the little spider uh, thing also can be outfitted with various accoutrements, if you will, including uh, like a metal hull, uh, things that de-radiate you. Uh, just they give you the options when you start if you want to use these these items that to help you along the way. Uh, they are finite. Uh, so if you, you use them all, then they won't be around for long. And you can also deradiate yourself between rounds if you've got if you've got that particular option lit up. <clears throat> so that seems like there's a lot going on, but there's one aspect of this I, that that you have to go get into, which is the jumping of this thing. Aside from the fact of crawling around on the ground, if you hit up on the joystick, your your uh, spider uh, machine will jump, and it also will sort of slightly increase the speed that the, of the scroll. Uh, and if you pull back, he will slow down. So you can slightly adjust the speed. But jumping is critical in this. And the jumping of your ship, it's sort of floaty. Uh, and, but it never seems to go as far as you think. I, I noticed that myself. Plus, some of the enemies, uh, are you can only shoot them if you're in the air. And some you can only hit on the ground. So it's got that sort of Zaxxony thing. You'll know the ones you can hit in the air because there'll be a shadow underneath them that to kind of tell you uh, that, uh, that they're coming on. Uh, so... What did I think of this game? Well, uh, it's very Activision-y in terms of the look of it, the sound, uh, and so that's it. It looks, I'd say, it looks okay. I don't think it's the, any great shakes, but I think it's okay. Uh, how does it play? Well, I found the game to be uh, pretty difficult, if, if uh, truth be told. Uh, the uh, The fact of the matter is, the control of the ship is not the best. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, it's not like that. you're not getting screwed on the controls. It's just the, the ship is hard to navigate. Uh, the terrain that they put in front of you can be, um, in fact, I, I would say at some points it's actually straight up cheap. Uh, and uh, the uh, enemies, ha having to shoot enemies while you're in the air is a difficult addition to the fact that you're already trying to jump to avoid stuff. It makes it tough. Uh, the enemies can come at you quickly, and uh, you can lose lives at a pretty rampant pace in this if you if you don't watch. Uh, they do give you a goodly amount of lives at the beginning, uh, but you can die off pretty quickly. I never completed a map of this. I'm sure Brent probably did because he's a good hand, but I, I didn't. You, you mean I did not? You wait, 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 wait. You didn't complete the like, as in clear off all the That's spaces. That's right. Yeah. Oh God, no. I didn't okay, do that yeah. Either. I mean, I, I finished levels, tons of levels, but yeah, I didn't complete yeah, the whole map. I found the entire <laughs> map is like. It's sixty four levels it's or huge. something, yeah. maybe more than that. It's yeah. huge. It's a huge map. Uh, I still, I, I got better as I went on. Now, the, a few of my other problems, aside from the fact it's the controls a little wonky, there's a lot of stuff coming at you, and there's a lot of stuff on the screen. I don't think they differentiate the targets. Uh, the th I don't think they differentiate the stuff you want and the stuff you don't want uh, enough. I would like to have seen like a radical color change, something because sometimes that can get confusing. Also. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is you can, you can get tons and tons and tons of these artifacts, but unless you come upon some point to drop them, you just carry them around. <laughs> and, so, and when you die, you lose half your artifacts, which is a real bummer. Uh, I do think that they do progress the levels quite nicely. Uh, the obstacles get more difficult to deal with. They actually change the landscape uh, with these uh, obstacles. And the different levels really do have a different feel sometimes. Uh, but uh, so they and they also add a lot of uh, uh, of bad guys. But overall, I don't know. This game I found sort of frustrating, Brent. And I, it's not one I really want to play over and over. I mean, I kind of got into it after a while, uh, but it's not something that really uh, uh, did it for me. What did What did you think of this one? Actually, I think I enjoyed this more than you. Okay. Uh, it has a few things going for it that are pretty amazing. First of all, it's just the perspective of walking on the – playing the game. It's sort of this – it's not an above view, but it's not an over-the-shoulder view. It's sort of like this 45-degree angle view, which is uh, perfect for what the game is trying to pull off because it wants you to know that there are things in the air and there are things on the ground and that you have to adjust what you're doing accordingly. And with the view and the shadows – together 
I never got confused. I knew what was off the ground, and I knew what was on the ground at all times. Big thumbs up for that, because in games like Zaxxon, that kind of do the same, they're trying to do the same perspective thing, uh, I often get confused. I think Zaxxon pulls it off better, and I think that's partially because of the, of the slant uh, when you play it, I like I said I had I had more no, trouble I in this than Zaxxon. Disagree. I love Zaxxon. I like the way I I never have any trouble with that in terms of that. But that I think it's just different strokes, different folks on that. Uh, mm. The next thing, the uh, the enemy variety, <sighs> you can't just have a different shape and it be a different enemy. Yeah. And that's something this game does do yeah. a lot. I agree with that. There are it, it, realistically there are two types of enemies. There are enemies that sit there and do nothing, and you shoot them for points. And if you do run into them, you die. But they are, they're they're not really the obstacle you think they could be. And then there's an enemy that will fly down the screen at you, shooting and trying to get in your way will actually track to your person. In fact, there's an item you can use, the Scrambler, that makes it so he won't track. Uh, he'll just fly yeah. straight down the screen instead of actually trying to find you. Uh, I And he's, to be completely honest, he's not terribly difficult either because he's on the screen for such a small Unless amount of time. Unless he catches you at a, at a bad point, in which case... I mean, yeah, of course, yeah. There, there's always but, times that he could get at you, but most of the time he's not trouble Yeah, they either. don't come out that often, at least on the levels I was on, and so they weren't a huge deal. I agree with that. Well, the the farther you get, and there are zones that you get in uh, that they do come out more often. So, how do you die in this game? You die by radiation. Yeah. Well, I mean, you and, or, well, I mean, you can hit stuff, obviously, you get shot. But I, I almost all of my deaths were due to that's radiation. That's funny because I didn't but, die. I didn't get. I kept. I just kept hit shooting those. Uh, you know, shooting the the little diamonds, and that, I kept me in pretty good shape radiation wise. But did you not do I, that that much? Well, I think maybe the difference is you were going fast and running into objects while I was going slow and taking more overtime damage. Well, I will say it's Which, tough to not want to go fast. This game runs... I mean, if you can play this and it's really slow if you if you want it to be. And, it, but, and yeah. by that, I mean all, all, kind of boring, frankly. Well, it's... No, I don't agree with that. It's not a boring factor. Well, if you if you walk it's, real slow, it gets it's, 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 I, I didn't like that. I mean, I, if you walk real slow though, then you have to deal with radiation yeah. more. Yeah, and Which is it, why it comes down there. to yeah, it's it comes down to what kind of level you're on. Like you were saying before, there are green, yellow, and red zones, and depending on what uh, color you're exploring on the map, is how much radiation there is. And when the map is red, the radiation gain is ridiculous. Yeah, it is bad. I mean, it is Absolutely. crazy over the top, so you have to go faster. Uh, and I, I think that's good. I think that is all that is good. The collecting the artifacts, good. Bringing them back to base. Find, you have to find the base on the map and then get to it. I think all of that is good. I really think this is, is a full package game that is absolutely worth emulating uh, or if you have a C64, uh, I think this is one that you could own and have a lot of fun with. You didn't with. find it frustrating when you couldn't find one, a place to drop off those artifacts? Because there's no set place. They just seem to randomly appear. And I could have a stack of those things a mile high, but if you can't drop them off, what good are they? That drove me nuts. Uh, I wish every level had something. you know, Or at least every couple level, you could be guaranteed that you're going to find a place to drop those off. No, I, I don't think that. Because they're on the map. Uh, you just ha and as you explore the map, you uncover uh, like a fog of war, like a modern fog yeah. of war. You slowly uncover more, and it, as you explore out, more becomes visible. And uh, they more they're on the map. I know, but they need so, more. There's not enough. I disagree. <laughs> I think that part of the challenge, I mean, the game is getting those artifacts to your destination. So if they made it too easy, then the, it, there'd be no challenge. I think the only thing in this game that really drives me crazy, and, and I think it would have been, uh, maybe this would have been too hard for back in the day, but I would have liked, because you're always going vertical, I would have liked some stages to have you going horizontal. Just a, a something different, maybe make it, you know, uh, uh, 
less about the height thing on those levels and more about shooting more enemies or being more bombarded with enemies. The funny thing is you could do that without actually changing your actual ship. You can, I mean, because it goes yeah. sideways. <laughs> you could you could easily yeah, have done I mean, that. I mean, you would have to you'd have to greatly change the gameplay because the gameplay is based off of <clears throat> the items being at different heights, and it plays into that a lot because some barriers you can jump over. Uh, most walls, it, it makes more sense to dodge because uh, trying to jump them can be tricky. But I, I really enjoyed this game. I thought this was uh, very innovative for the time. Having the power pickups, well, most of the items uh, are not that great. Uh, the the D radiator absolutely necessary. Yes, and you can find those on the levels, but yeah. those seem to be the rarest of the rare. Uh, the 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 scrambler thing, eh, and yeah, I agree. You know, I didn't I didn't use the scrambler, so the the ship wouldn't track yeah, you. It didn't matter. <laughs> and yeah. then you you could also pick up Aaron. I don't know if you ever did this. There's invulnerability in the game. Uh, and you that's not an item that you select before the level. It's just something you yeah. get in the level that will transfer through many levels. But I thought that was pretty cool, too. Yeah. I, I, I really I enjoyed this game from top to bottom. I really thought it was a, uh, an overall great package. This game is the natural progression of an Activision 2600 game, to me. Uh, it's still got some of the most, the, with the enemies, the basic enemies, the, sort of the basic uh, uh, you know, ground graphics. Those are kind of throwbacks from the from the old twenty six hundred Activision days. But they've, with the ability to use a computer, they've they have they've taken it to like the next level. So for me, this was a progression of the old uh, Atari days. You know, so Activision sort of take taking outside the box. I don't know. I didn't hate this. Uh, I just I didn't. I the, my problem was I just didn't have that much fun with it. You know. So it there you go. It is what it is. Now I did. Just for fun, I uh, looked this up on the Atari and the C64. I, like I said, I initially played the Atari version of this. <clears throat> and I actually, I think I like the way the Atari version plays a little better than the C64 version, if I'm honest. Uh, the uh, C64 has uh, uh, probably is more attractive. But I, like, I, for, I, I enjoyed, I thought the way the ship moved and stuff in the Atari version, for whatever reason, was just neat. I liked. I think it looked cooler. It's hard to see side to side. You had sort of had to play it. The feel of it was better. But I mean, ultimately, there's not a ton of difference. I didn't have a chance to look at the MSX, Brent. But now that I've got the ability to play that stuff, I would definitely uh, check that out. Faux show. Um, I did have some luck uh, with this on finding some reviews. <clears throat> uh, Lemon gives uh, pa uh, past finder an eight, uh, and uh, Zap gave this a ninety three. Uh, back when they reviewed it, your 64 gave it 4 out of 5. Uh, Commodore User gave this a 76 out of 100. Home Computing Weekly gave it a 3 out of 5. And uh, Commodore Horizons gave this 5.7 out of 10, which I think that's a, that's oh, a little that's harsh. Unfair. Yeah. And Commodore yeah. User gave this a 2.75 out of 5, which also is a little bit harsh. I think, I think it's definitely a title that's worth... Uh, checking out, I mean, it is a different, it is different. I mean, there's no doubt about that. It's yeah. an unusual title. Uh, I looked on eBay for these. I could not find any cartridge listings that had been sold or were for sale. I did find uh, the disc version boxed for 89 bucks or best offer. And, yeah, I know. I did find the tape. If you're in the UK, you can get the tape of this for $7, not too, or $7 American. Uh, but uh, I didn't see any tapes in the U.S., so this is probably one if you, for whatever reason, wanted to bring in the tape, you'd have to go hunt it. Uh, but yeah, an interesting title. I'm glad I played it. Uh, it's it's a, But for me, it's sort of a mixed bag. I can't give it a big enthusiastic attaboy uh, because of the problems I mentioned. But I mean, it, it was definitely different, so I will say that, man. So, Brinster, uh, uh, that was a look at Pathfinder. Now, what did you dig up uh, this week to play on cartridge week oh my oh my what did i dig up i took a little dive into the dragon's den and holy cow i, I i'm so glad that i did <clears throat> dragon's den developed uh by andy finkel back in 1983 uh released solely for the c64 and i believe that it was only available on cartridge. Mm. So, what does Dragon's Den entail? Dragon's Den is a three-stage round, you know, 
play-in circuit adventure where you are atop a mighty Pegasus and you are tasked with slaying a brutal dragon. Uh, the first stage in this takes you uh, to get into the actual cave itself. And to do that, you have to kind of distract the guardians of the cave, which are these pterodactyl bird-like creatures. They look like demons from the de from uh, Satan's Hollow, didn't they, Brent? They, they are very they look, Satan's they look, Hollow, in fact, yes. This, these look, you could have easily used these guys to make a Satan's Hollow. Like, just shrink them yes. down a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, there's, I believe they're supposed to be young dragling, dragons. The, the, the uh, instructions I read said that they were birds. They didn't specify what they were exactly. I kind of thought, that, when I played it, I thought they were young dragons as well. And, and the way this works is you have to rowl them out of their cave. And once they're up in the air, you can take your uh, your ma your mighty joust uh, lance, if you will, and, and slay them by running into them. And once that's done, you've cleared the way to actually get into the dragon's cave. <clears throat> and the dragon's cave is a very long corridor filled with spiders and bats and uh, uh, weird like things that look like magical the glaive. Room. Uh, and yeah, a little glaive like, and you have to travel down this path, uh, and you have to avoid most of the dangers, but you can slay the different bats that might come up. <clears throat> and uh, it's actually in three sections. Yeah. The first section you're you're dodging spiders. The second section you're dodging bats and magic. And then the third section, you're dodging arrows, which don't make a whole lot of sense, but whatever. Um, and after that, you finally reach the dragon's den. And the dragon is inside of its its egg, which I guess it's sort of like a coffin for a vampire. Oh. It, it, it just kind of lives in there. And there's a lot of these uh, creatures in its den kind of protecting it, hanging from the ceiling. And they will come down and one by one attack you. And as you kill them, you actually are deteriorating the egg that the dragon is hiding in. And once the, the dragon's egg is completely diminished, the dragon will escape from it and start attacking you. And then it is a one-on-one -on -one battle, you versus dragon, where you have to take your, your lance and stab the dragon four times. Uh, as you go through the different levels of, of power and eventually slaying him. And this is when the game, uh, all that's awesome. It is all awesome. I'm... Every all every bit of it, good yeah. fun, great fun. And then the magic yes. happens. Because after that, you realize the game doesn't take itself too seriously. And you get a Pac-Man-esque style cutscene. That... And, that was uh, surprising, I, was I will see... say that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect that. I was able to see three of them, and I'm going to spoil the, I'm going to spoil people because I'm going to tell people what they are. The very first one is the absolute classic Pac-Man. You, he, The dragon chases you off one side of the screen, and then when it comes back, you're chasing the dragon through the other side of the screen. Very classic Pac-Man. The second one has uh, you mounted on top of the dragon instead of on your Pegasus horse and uh, has you chasing the Pegasus around. And then it kind of has like, like what's going on? Like, like question marks. Like they know it's not right, but they can't figure out exactly what's wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the third one, uh, you, your main character is not even a part of it. Uh, the Pegasus and the dragon go on a date and fall in love. And it plays out in a little cut scene. I mean, that is just good, campy crap. I love it. Yeah. Uh, the graphics on this, I saw a lot of people kind of hating on the graphics. And I will agree, they're not the most colorful things in the world. <clears throat> most enemies are a solid color. Uh, most backgrounds uh, look somewhat amateurish. But it... it it has a very B movie feel. Like I could actually see this gameplay scripted out into a B movie and be just completely thrilled with it. Uh, everything looks like what it's supposed to look like though. I never got confused on what was what. So I appreciated that.
the sound. Uh, I have a problem when games do this, and I think the sound is the absolute worst part of the game. They take classical music, uh, and like, uh, uh, oh, Aaron, help me out with the name of the song that it plays on the first level. It, it's, it, it's un. It was something stupid like Cape Town Races or something. No, no, it was it was a uh, uh, Suze- oh Susanna Night and Ball Mount. It was uh, Ball Mountain. Oh, I'm talking song. about the, when you win. It plays that dopey no, song. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> it it, it plays. It takes cl- pieces of classical music and and then of course uh, beeps and boops it up. And the the, the yeah, it does play a, a really amateurish tune at the, when you win. Yeah. I wish it wouldn't have done that. I'm not saying it had to do serious music, <clears throat> and, and I, I just don't like when games take classical music and, and put them into the game where I don't think it always fits. Like the first one fits okay, but I think they could have done a cooler music for the for the uh, tunnel. And I think they could have done a cooler music. Well, you think Oh Suzanne is appropriate or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I think it was a missed opportunity. I have a feeling since <laughs> this guy did everything for this game, he was the developer he was the uh, uh, musician, the whole nine yards. I have a feeling he just, uh, music wasn't his thing. <clears throat> he pulled from some archives and called it a day. Now, I don't like that, but I'm okay with it. It's okay. It doesn't It doesn't hurt the game too terribly. The controls in this game are off the charts. Uh, you have to flap your Pegasus. And normally I hate that kind of crap. I've said it many times, I do not like Joust uh, because of the constant flapping. This game is different. This game, you can actually, first of all, adjust how powerful the flaps are. And it's not a, it's not just a continuous button mash to, to stay airborne. It's all a very adjustable to fit how you are. There, there, are, there are light, medium, and strong uh, flaps that you can set up. Uh it is floaty, but it's supposed to be. You're on a Pegasus. Um, the combat using the joust to to stab or the uh, the lance to stab stuff, perfect, perfect for what this is trying to do. And the lance is very extended from your horse. It feels very powerful, or your Pegasus, I should say. I just adored this game, Aaron. What did you think about well, it? I think I'm pretty sure this was a pretty early game in a C64. 83. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, listen. First of all, let's, you didn't touch on the fact that the uh, the the box for this is awesome. The box is the box is awesome. the bomb. You got to get just no. It's not the bomb because that's a no. Dumb phrase. No, it's it, but it's very D and D. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. Now, uh, this game I've never heard of or played, but man, this is right up my alley. Uh, I love it. I love multiple gameplay elements on one screen. It does that. I love multiple uh, 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 stages. I love that. The graphics are good. The last stage with the dragon is awesome looking. The big uh, encompassing egg thing. This fire. The, I like the fact that it <clears throat> it highlights when an enemy's coming. I, I found it awesome. And then when you free the dragon, I thought the fight with the dragon was fun. I like the fact that the screen wraps around in the, in the, uh, sort of in a joust way. I mean, you could say this is they took. Uh, uh, they took some things from Joust, but that would be a disservice because they're. I mean, there's. <laughs> listen, you're a flying horse with a with a with a uh, a javelin or whatever. You're gonna. It, it, that's what jousting is. So I, I, I'm not. This is not. No. I have no problem with this being in the same universe as Joust. No problem there. I love the multiple levels. <clears throat> I think there was a few letdowns. The spider level. The spiders sort of suck. I don't like the way that they move with you. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't look... That that element of the game is the weakest part for me. The spiders don't look good because when you go past them, them and their spider web move with you, and it's a, it's just a, it's, yeah, it's no good. Yeah, it's a weird slide. They, I would like to see something done better there. I like the elements. As you go through the game, they get more difficult. They add more stuff. The, the stuff gets tougher faster. The uh, Like, for example, the dragon gets a fireball. He shoots at you when you get hit yeah. the second time with him. Uh, the halftime thing, I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was like stunned at that. I, yeah, yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't believe. I could not believe that. 
<laughs> that that halftime thing came out, and that was great. I like the game. I mean, it's 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 almost like a uh, they've almost pushed like an arcade game when you put that halftime show in because you know that that makes it a lot more fun. But I mean, ultimately. This is sort of one of those games that, as a kid, you would think, oh, yeah, that's uh, that's cool. You know, this has got that cool element to it. You're fighting a dragon. You're on a flying horse. There's things that look like demons. There's dragons. There's freaking uh, a fire and all the stuff you love. I loved every bit of it. Now, would I like to have seen some awesome C64 music in this? You bet I would. Uh, yes. But like you said, you, sometimes you, you you get what you get, and I think that's one area where this game uh, did drop the ball. The in, the victory tune is stupid. Uh, it's 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 okay, but it's just dumb. It's like it, that made again that was a that was made it a more arcadey feeling that it I, I would have put something cooler in there, like you said with the music. Uh, but overall, I like this. I liked every part of it. This is a big surprise. I I, I never heard of this game. And, man, I thought it was awesome. And so I give you kudos on this one. I think you found another winner uh, with this one. And I think I think uh, uh, Andy Finkel, I don't know, if did you did you see if he did the others? I know he, I mean, he was a guy that worked. I believe he was an employee at Commodore. I mean, obviously he was, but I believe he was like a, <laughs> I believe he was, I don't mean, I don't think he was a games maker. I think he was a guy that actually worked like an engineering type guy. So Because I've heard his name before. Uh, so I didn't see anything else that he had done uh and even linking from the uh the commodore 64 wiki uh i wasn't able to see anything else that he was attached to um now that said sometimes one and done is fine so well you know this this was a winner (laughs) oh no i take that back apparently he was attached to uh three other games looks like uh international tennis right uh Lazarian hmm. and Omega Race. Well, Omega Race. Uh, that's a. I think it's an arcade port. There. This was a good yeah. one, though, man. I I, uh, I give this one double kudos. Did you get any reviews or anything? Uh, there were some reviews. Uh, pretty much. Uh, the the overall feel of this back in the day was eh. Uh, I I guess they just could not see the brilliance. Very middle of the road. Uh, six from C64 games out of ten, and uh, mm. uh, Lemon, of course, a modern day review of it was uh, six and seven, uh, respectively. Very good. So let's, you know, we did get. I want to go over the Discord reviews for both these games, so we kind of passed them over. So we'll, we'll get to yours first, and we'll then we'll backtrack. So uh, we got a review in here from our old buddy uh, John Boat of Car Schaller. He writes, "Now this is a game." Following in the grand tradition of Jungle Hunt, this multi-stage adventure hooked me from from the beginning. The flying controls are fast and tight. Between this and the Phantom Riders of the Coco, I love every game where you mount the Pegasus. The middle, the middle <laughs> stages of the cavern were easy at first, but became more difficult as you looped around again. And the multi-stage battle with the dragon was really a unique way to present the final stage. Great music, as to be expected from the C64, and it even has cutscenes. This game was just another example of why, if you're a real gamer, the C64 was the micro to have, awful colors or no. So, boat, boat backhanded compliments left and right uh, uh, for the C64. <laughs> I, he was wearing a C64 shirt last night on the show, and this is a guy that's battered the C64 for years. So, he's really, he turned the corner on the C64. <clears throat> Mitsuyama wrote in, uh... Uh, this game lacks some flair and polish. The graphics are uninspiring, and the music is basic for the C64. But it is an early C64 game, so this can be forgiven, as it's not fair to compare it with the later releases where the developers learned how to make this machine sing. The gameplay, however, is pretty good. The controls are tight, and the difficulty ramps up nicely as you complete the loops. I did experience a couple of cheap deaths. That's Yes, you will get those, because they sometimes will spawn you right where you die. Uh, but especially on the final dragon stage, which is disappointing. But overall, I found this to be a fun game. Seven out of ten. Uh, I want to backtrack for a minute, Brent, if I may. Uh, we got some reviews in on uh, uh, on pa- on past Finder. Uh, John writes in. I'm a huge fan of Activision's early '80s catalog. They created some of the best minute to learn, lifetime to master play mechanics on the 2600 as well as other systems. This game looks okay. 
though limited by the C64 color palette compared to the superior Atari 8-bit original. There he goes. The variable speed scrolling is smooth and your ship moves around just like I imagined a War of the Worlds Martian would. But I'm not feeling the love for this game. The documentation likes any pictures. So for a long time, I wasn't even sure what an artifact, a base, or a station was. That's true. There are no pictures. You have to figure that out. Because I've got the actual yeah. docs. Um, seriously, the, this game's lack of good docs is a real problem. Next, everything seems to be random. So I would collect 10 plus artifacts and never come across a base. Yep. Or a station to drop them off. And then die and find bases and stations all over the place in the next game, of course, with no artifacts to be found. I hate to give Activision Game a bad review, but this one's a stinker. He panned him. He panned it, Brent. Oh, I don't... I And Mitsuyama uh, chimes in. This game grew on me. I didn't know uh, what was going on at first. Consulting the docs helped a little, but they needed to include pictures that showed you what the pickups, bases, and stations looked like. Or even better, show them in game on the title screen. Again, there's another guy mentioning it. I agree with that. However, I, once I worked out what I was supposed to be doing, the game sucked its claws into me. The graphics are functional, and the sound is basic, but the controls and the handling of the crafts are very satisfying, leading to great gameplay, which kept me coming back for more. The only issue I had with the controls is that having to jump and accelerate led to some accidental deaths. Yes. This game, uh, this is a game that I'll return to, and I'll also check out that Atari 8-bit version, 8 out of 10. So, yes. both games, Brent, uh, have something appealing uh, to, uh, for, to each of them, and uh, I think uh, it would not be the worst idea for uh, listeners and viewers to give them a spin. You see what I did yes. there, Brent? Let's have a... No, I have no what idea. What do you mean? It's time for the wheel. It's time for the wheel oh. to spin the wheel. Come on, man. Now, Brent, this week we've added a couple newbies to the wheel here. I've got uh, a, a, uh, I've got a piece here from Olaf Hope. I believe it's in chat. Manage your games, non-sport. Interesting. And the flashback this week, the retro rewind, if you will, the Intellivision, Brent. The Intellivision. Yes. Have any thoughts on this one? Uh, I don't want to play the Intellivision. I love the Intellivision. So let's not get so that. I, I would love to play it, frankly. Let me get this thing in view, and we are off. Here we go. Huh. And the winner is, oh man, that's what I've been dreading, Brent. This is the week for type in games, Brent. Type in games. Yep. You, hey, this is your baby. Although people did request this one, Brent. Uh, what do you think about type in games? Here, what's what's how are we going to play that? Uh, we are going to have to type in games, yeah, well, duh, obviously. Yeah. And and then uh, we will give our finished masterpieces to each other. So that we do not have to. No, we in don't two have to games. program these games. We just have to type them. Oh in. no, we have to type them. Right, in. but I mean, we don't have to make up a game. Is my point. We've got to go. Does, oh no! Does no, it no, matter no, what no, computer no, we no. do it on? No, I don't think so. Okay, I will probably. Hmm, I'm looking at what's the easiest thing. I might do mine on the Coco since I've got it sitting right here. Uh, but that's kind of what I was planning yeah, on doing. So, so we'll see. There you go. We'll now, see. with that out of the way, Brent, it's time. I think if you are ready. For the big, three big spins on the prize wheel. Are you ready? Yes. Here we go. Let me, let me hit your music, Brent. Now, how this is going to work. Uh, we had a catastrophic wheel failure during testing. We, by that means him, not me. <coughs> where the uh, the flapper flew off of the prize wheel and lost, lost to all time. However, I was able to make repairs to the wheel... Uh, so the the show must go on, as they say. If we have a catastrophic failure during the prize spinning uh, portion, if a winner is clear, uh, we will that the the spin will stand. This... If something happens and it's pointing in between two names or it's a kind of a toss up, uh, we will spin again. So, with that out of the way, the first prize we will be spinning with. Oh, one other thing. If you see here, everyone is on the wheel. All 12 names are on the wheel. Uh, so we may have a few adjustments. Rendering last All week's baloney. will be on the wheel. Yeah. And what will happen is if someone wins two prizes, uh, it will spin again. They can only win 
one prize, and it'll be the first time their name is spun. Now, out. Brent, do you, I, I believe Frontier Gibberish, and who was the other guy that got hosed last weekend? But that's all gone now. That's all yeah. gone. Yeah. So everyone's we, we on the wheel all... for every spin. Is what he's saying. That's Brent, correct. Th you, this... uh, however, you cannot win twice. <laughs> Your contest. Only you break the prize wheel on the day of the contest. What an idiot. All right, I can't see the bottom of the whistle. Get it a good angle here. Uh, no, we st the colors are gone. There you go. Now, spin that sucker. This is for what's the prize here? Prize one is a uh, ARG Presents Lanyard. Okay, fire it up. It appears that Pixels at Dawn, hey. which I believe already owns a a lanyard, now will have two, two lanyards. Hey, two lanyards. That's a perfect gift on an anniversary or or a, a birthday. You give that to the wife or the or the girlfriend. That, I think that'll get you over. Absolutely. Okay, so congratulations, yeah. Pixels congratulations, at Dawn. Pixels. Uh, we will be contacting you. I, I believe I have all your information, but we will double up and make sure. All right. And uh, that is one prize down, two prizes to go. The second prize, ladies and gentlemen, is a uh, quarter slot keychain from New Wave. Quarter sh quarter slot keychain from New from New Wave. Here we go. And that will be going to Duncan Styles. Duncan Styles. The dunk. We will be uh, contacting you for some information, and we will be getting that to the mail completely free. We're gonna send that to you. I hope you enjoy it. It's a hefty, hefty keychain. Yeah. And it, if you ever need to beat a man with a quarter slot, now you'll yeah. be able to. Now, 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 yes, Aaron, my friend. Now, do you think that it was? Uh, per chance or just happenstance that on the day that I give away a where we give away a Dragon's Lair Mini yeah. that I play a game called Dragon's Den. Yeah, that was all part of your cunning plan? No, it was actually very coincidental. Yeah, I kind of figured but, that, yeah. But, this is the big spin. All right. And you know what? This is kind of like a, a bonus for everyone involved. Oh, yeah. Because I'll never have to say Dragon's Lair Mini yeah. again, and I'm sure everyone will be happy yeah, about that. Yeah, I agree. So, this is the big spin, ladies and gentlemen, for the Dragon's Lair Mini. Free of charge, shipped straight to you. Let's do it. Here we go. I can't, I and can't the winner it. is Adam Troyoff. Or Torfino, congratulations! Adam Torfino, there it is, man. We, we will be contacting you uh, via your uh, the way you won the contest, and I'm almost sure yes, you did send us an email. So we will be contacting you through email. Please be looking forward to that. If anyone does not want their prize for any reason, uh, we will respin next week. Oh god. So if we if we contact Adam you must he's take like, your prize a point or be beaten. <laughs> if we contact Adam and he's like Dragon's Lair Mini, no, I don't want that crap. Are you kidding me? We will respin Listen. it. I can't imagine that happening. This is a wonderful prize from us. And the reason why we're doing this, Aaron, just to make sure everyone oh understands. God, look at this. Hands this over the is, heart. Oh it is. It's very heartfelt. This is uh this was all about saying uh, thank you to the community. Uh, seriously, you guys are absolutely wonderful. Long suffering. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the 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 support that you guys give us week in and week out uh, is is why we do this. And this was just a small way of giving back. And I hope that uh, we can do this again. I'm already wheels are turning for the a next contest thing we can do. I really enjoy giving back to a community that gives yes, us so much. very good. And thank you again. Congratulations. Uh, uh, Brent will be contacting all the big winners tonight. And uh, we do appreciate everyone for uh, taking care of us and putting up with our antics, particularly Brent's. 
Brent, uh, next week, type in games. We're going really off the deep end on this one. Uh, yep. So I, yes, we are. I, do we have a deadline when we have to get these to each other? That's probably... We, I would say Wednesday. Oh, man. I think that's okay. fair. Well, I'll be looking through some old books and stuff. I, uh, this is going to be one of those times where the Discord's going to have to help me out and pick me out some good programs to type in. So, Well, with all that... Thankfully, we are both... I, do you know your typing speed, Aaron? Do you have any idea? Let's just say I've got the jack. As you know, I got the, so I've you got don't the mojo on keyboard. Listen, <laughs> when you type as fast as I do, there's no there's no tracking it. I know when I applied for a job with the bank, like I finished my typing test and was out the building and in the car, and no one else had finished. I was gone. So yeah, I got I got plenty of jack, my friend. I take care of business. Of course, that's when you're programming it, when you're typing in a program, it's not the same kind of thing. It's just typing. <laughs> so yeah, so but we'll we'll figure it out. Well, listen, thanks everybody for popping in. Thanks for participating. And uh, we appreciate you. Thanks, everybody, that uh, showed up last night in the uh, uh, International Computer Club meeting. Uh, it was a happening. Uh, it was a slim trim, four hours and eight minutes, just as I planned it. Uh, it went like, <laughs> ran like clockwork, uh, no problems. Uh, and we'll, so we will be done with that. We finished up the ICC and the contest on the same day. I love it. We're done. <laughs> Back to normal starting <laughs> next week. It's the way we do it. That's right, Mae was speaking. Mitsuyama's gets it. We covered that on Amigo. So now I've got Mae in my back pocket, Brent. I'll, I'll be typing the hell out of this thing. <laughs> All right, y'all. We'll talk to you guys next week. Have a safe and prosperous week. And until next time, bye-bye. Thanks for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed the show. Hello to our YouTube subscribers and our Twitch followers. A special thank you to Duncan Styles for our vector graphics and Bartbit for an amazing closing theme. Want to help keep ARG spinning for as little as a dollar a month? You can do so at our new Patreon at patreon.com slash ARG presents. Just like these fine folks. Graham W. Vetke, Rolo, Olaf Hope, Anthony Jarvis, Terry Howard, Gary Heather, John Schaller, the Slow Norris, Frodo NL, Steve Rathmason, Bernhard Lucas, Chris Folds, Mitsuyama, Jason Warns, Rob Flack O'Hara, Andy Craig, Dave Velociraptor, Retroalogy, Hermsky, Rauschy, John Dykeman, Jerry Dennington, Z9K9, and Mr. B. Don't want to explain another credit card bill? That's okay, too. You can help us out by leaving us a positive review on Spotify or Apple iTunes. Have an idea for a wheel piece? Email it to us at argpresents at mail.com. We film live every Sunday, 10 a.m. EDT on Twitch. Hope to see you there.